Business Inspired Insider.com interview, we talk with Dr. Joseph Michelli, best-selling author, author of Leading the Starbucks Way. He talks about how you can connect with your customers better and what Starbucks did that we can learn from. He also tells some very deeply personal stories. They were so touching. You have to listen to them and who this book is dedicated to and why. That and much more. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have Dr. Joseph Michelli. He's New York Times number one best-selling author of books, including you may have heard The Zappos Experience, The Starbucks Experience, The New Gold Standard about Ritz-Carlton, When Fish Fly, which I've listened to many times when it was on tape cassette, and many more. And his newest book is Leading the Starbucks Way, Five Principles for Connecting with Your Customers, Your Products, and Your People. Joseph, thanks for being here. Jeremy, I could not be happier than to be with you tonight. This is great. <laughs> Me too. And I always like to start off with a fun fact. You know, you're a best-selling author. I'll show you, you're, you're, like, you're normal like the rest of us. What's a fun fact about you that's quirky or a funny hobby that you have? Well, I, a fun fact, probably, you know, I, I definitely have some strangeness to me. I think that if anybody achieves a level of success and they don't have strangeness, then you better be suspicious. But um, for me, I actually am a state champion dairy judge. Now, dairy not judge. everybody you know can talk about breed characteristics of Holstein cattle. So, uh, you know, just be careful, Jeremy. You go into Holstein, you're in deep trouble. Wait, here. where did you grow up? Where was that from? Uh, I grew up in southern Colorado, and I oh. used to work on my uncle's dairy farm, where I was accused of leaning on hoes more than actually using them to weed out the weeds <laughs> in the garden. Interesting. I, I would never have known that. Um, yeah. So for you, I want to start off, and, you know, you've had a lot of success in your career, a lot of books, a lot, and you're a wonderful speaker, storyteller. Tell me about some of the motivation, where you get it from early on from your childhood. What was that like? You know, I had a very strange start to my childhood. I was, um, I was adopted at two months of age, and it turns out that I was abandoned at three days of age in a trash can. So you can wow. kind of see that I started off in the uh, kind of uh, some – my classic joke is that I'm truly white trash. Holy uh, cow. But – yeah, three days of age, I was abandoned and put in a trash can in southern Colorado, adopted to Joe and Marie Michelli. I knew I'd kind of had an auspicious beginning, but I didn't know the degree until later on in life. But I was raised by wonderfully loving Italian parents. Uh, I was an only child, spoiled rotten probably. I had a mom who had many miscarriages early on in life and finally got her child through adoption. And fairly overprotective, uh, boy child in an Italian family is a pretty remarkable way to grow up. But it was a small town, had probably a limited learning environment and a fairly limited educational opportunities early on, but was fortunate enough to get to go to a Catholic grade school about midway through my elementary school experience and, and went from there into Catholic high schools and uh, had a wonderful series of scholarships that allowed me to go to college. And so early life was uh, pretty simple in a small town in Southern Colorado. Were you your parents, were they authors? What did they do? How did you get that itch <laughs> to... To do this. Oh, that's just funny. I, 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 from your lips to God's ears, had that been the case, it might have made life a little easier. My dad was a heavy equipment operator, uh, barely graduated from high school, went to the concentration camps uh, or CC camps, the work camps thereafter. And then my mom did not graduate from high school. She made it to, uh, to 10th grade and then dropped out in order to help her family. They peddled vegetables on the side of the road, she really? and her sister and her mother. So, uh, yeah, they did not come from wealth. We were very lower socioeconomic blue collar folks and uh, their educational skills and their their even their language skills were somewhat limited probably so what do you what lessons do you take from early on from from them I uh, love your kids you know at the end of the day it doesn't matter how much you have it doesn't matter how smart you are uh, it doesn't matter if you can read or write much as long as you love hard on them and you encourage them to to meet their potential whatever that might be mm -hmm. um, I think that was the key they loved me hard and and they did their very best uh, with limited resources in many ways but an abundance of love yeah and you know you've had other uh, another Starbucks book and leading the Starbucks way when I was reading through it and I was really touched by the the beginning part um, 
And could you tell people a little bit about uh, your wife and her contributions and why this is kind of bittersweet? Oh, yeah. I, I dedicate this book to Nora. I, I made the fatal error of not dedicating my dissertation to her, and she made a point that that was kind of important that I acknowledge her. I actually uh, read the title of your dissertation. It's the longest. Oh, my God. It's so long. Jeremy, you're worrying me. Do you have no life? <laughs> Jeremy, read the, the title of my dissertation. And that probably took a week right there. Um, yeah, no. So, Nora, the book was dedicated to Nora. It was uh, written in the final throes of Nora's life. She battled breast cancer for six years huh. and just a valiant warrior in terms of uh, trying to extend her life as long as possible, primarily to see her youngest child, our daughter Fiona, graduate from high school. She didn't quite achieve that huh. mission, but she took every single possible treatment to, to try to extend her life out to that mm -hmm. point. So the book, um, the dedication is definitely to her in my acknowledgement section. Uh, it was a very difficult time to write a book, as you might imagine, and we were on deadline, and there were moments when uh, the person who I worked with for years, my senior vice president of ops, Lynn, just said, I don't think we're going to be able to make this deadline this time. Um, but as it turned out, uh, we kind of turned the jets up a little bit. Nora was Definitely. I mean, I was writing this book while she was getting radiation and chemotherapy wow. and PET scans and, and the like. But, um, you know, she definitely was an inspiration to me just because she had this tenacious desire to fight on. Yeah, that sounds really difficult. And I'm, I'm so sorry to hear that and read that. So when you read when people read through the book, what things will jump out as your wife's influence on, on your writing in this one? Oh, yeah, nobody's asked me this question. This is uh, this is going to do some introspection for a moment. You know, I think that if you're married for a long time, and I was married 24 years, I knew Nora two years prior to that. I'm not sure where she stopped and where I began. Um, and I think you know, good marriages, you elevate each other and you grow stronger and bigger. I would have never been able to write this book or any of my books had I not known Nora Michelli over the course of my lifetime. Mm. Um, so it's hard for me to separate any word out at the real literal level of this book. Book, she did not. She was not well enough to do much. There were times she would read through drafts of my book. She's a very educated woman. She had a master's degree, um, mm -hmm. so she could read my books and and kind of tell me what, from a layman's perspective, right. why this made absolutely no sense whatsoever. That's what I, I mean. Yeah, like you read her something, and she's like, "Joseph, take that out. That doesn't make sense." Yeah, or this? or put th that's a good story. Keep that one. Absolutely. Well, you know, and I think that one of the truths about Nora, and I think a lot of partnerships is that you bring different things to the table. She could she could read whether or not it was connecting, I think. I, I was writing and I was crafting, you know, I was doing all the stuff that I think I do and and she would tell me, nah, that doesn't make that doesn't work. And so and that's and having that is really important. And particularly the more you go in your career and and People start saying, well, you're a New York Times number one best-selling author. You must know how to write, right? Or sure. they, they are too kind to give you the real truth. So, uh, yeah, people close to you, uh, if they love you enough to be honest with you, uh, they can really help you not get too big for your own britches, really. You get the brutal truth. The brutal yeah. truth. Yeah. The naked truth, yes. Um, so the other question I was, I was thinking about, too, is so what made you do another Starbucks book? Great question, because you know there's more than one company out there, isn't there? Um, well, it's been a long time. I started well, I started with a fish book, as you know, the the Pike Place Fish Market, That's which great. is just a couple of feet down from where Starbucks was. So the first Starbucks book was a no-brainer in 2006. I started researching it in 2004. Now, if you think about it, I started researching in 2004. The brand was great in 2006, and then all of a sudden, it's 2008. They start to tank. They're closing down operating units, and there's a long run there. I'm writing books about everybody else but Starbucks. I'm writing about Ritz-Carlton and Zappos and UCLA Health Systems. So now we're about a decade out, 2004 to about when I started researching the book, 2012, about eight years. So much had happened in Starbucks, and it was time to go back. Plus, the first book was so amazingly successful, that logo on the front really helps sell books, <laughs> Yeah. Um, so it was yeah. just kind of a smart play, I think, to, to write about Starbucks again and to see them very differently than they were in 2004. Yeah. People are obsessed with Starbucks. You're right. Yeah. They are. They're addicted. It's a good thing. And that goes into, you know, the principles connecting with your customers, products, your people. What, I want to hear some of your favorite stories from the book. Well, you know, there's one that's so subtle, you don't even really see it. In fact, it was the starting point of the book, and uh, editors said it was just too depressing. Too many things in a row were depressing, so um, I uh, had to pull it out. But let me tell you this story, because it's kind of a backstory that you won't fully get from the book. Um, I was talking to a guy from Germany. Uh, about He was a customer in Germany. I said, why do you go to Starbucks? And he said, 
you know, because to be honest with you, I get bullied at work. I mean, I really get bullied at work. It almost makes me emotional, I'll tell you this. And he would say, you know, I go into work and I can barely hold on because my coworkers mistreat me. I have a boss who just hates me wow. and I don't know how much more I can do. He said, but you know, I then go to Starbucks every day at lunch. And for a few minutes, just for a few minutes, they know me, they know my drink, and they're nice to me. Wow. I'm That's like, powerful. okay, all right, enough. You know, I get it. So what it, it reminds me of, no matter what you do, no matter from what place you do it, we ha you have a momentary opportunity to elevate lives, to do something compelling and great. Uh, I don't care what you do. If you're a Scribner and you just copy things all day, uh, there is this chance somewhere in your day to touch someone and to do something of significance. Yeah. And I remember reading one of the stories about um, Joe Young mm -hmm. and what he did to save the company money. Can you tell, talk about that for a second and how maybe... Yeah. Let me tell you a quick side story yeah. quick on, because I was doing a webinar the other day and we looked at the people who were in attendance and Joe Young was in attendance. Really? So that, that's a side story that'll make sense to the viewers in just about 30 seconds. So Joe Young's a barista. He's just a guy who's out there making drinks for people all day long. And he's sitting around thinking about how can he make his company better? Because Starbucks just so happens to give stock benefits to all of its employees called bean stock of all things. Um, so this bean stock is something that he gets. And if his company does well, he gets a better contribution for his long term. So he's sitting around thinking and he's thinking at home, he's thinking in shower about how he can deal with the whipped cream containers better because they're not getting full use of the whipped cream. The way they're actually stocked and stored, there's always waste. So he comes up with this slight variation of technique, which I can't even tell you. I'd have to kill you. Uh, it's so super secret, but it's enough to get a little more whipped cream use out of, of every You container. mean the way he sprays it? Well, it's Is the that way what you're it's stored in between oh, sprays. Gotcha. That's what allows it to actually still be functional and more of it gets used out of the container. So and bottom line, he thinks this up, he tries it, it's starting to work and it's so simple. And it literally will save some $10 million across the, the hundreds of the thousands of operating units across 30 countries in the world. Wow. And the guy is recognized at a big old national conference that they had not too long ago down in Houston. And he's just, you know, he's a rock star legend now among the barista community of Starbucks. And here he is. He's tuned into my webinar the other day as we're talking about the book. And uh, yeah, I mean, those are the good people of the world. And every one of us can make a contribution to make our, our businesses yeah. and the lives of others better. And you know what? That's not a one-off story. There's many stories about Starbucks with employees. So someone listening to this, how do they cultivate that among people they hire or bring on the right people? Well, and I think it starts with getting people passionate about why should I care? I mean, I told you part of the backstory there is because you get profit if you make us richer. Okay. That gets you so far. But I think there's another dimension, which is to say, you know, we've got an important mission that we're on here together, you and I. And here's my vision. And I hear all this stuff about leadership vision. And I often say the difference between a vision and a hallucination is how many people see it, right? So if you're a leader and you have this big vision of how you can do great things from where you're you're coming from and you can sell that and the rest of the people see your vision not your hallucination then all of a sudden you have this ability to have people take a hill for you you know I, I have had bosses honest to goodness that I would do the bare minimum for in the course of my career and I was kind of hoping that somebody would figure out they were idiots and get rid of them uh, and then there were other people I just wanted to make their life wonderful relaxed successful because they loved on me, they cared about me, and they sold me on the notion that I was important and what we did collectively mattered. So I think the starting point is to help your people see how what you do matters. Give them the big why, yeah. not just the what and how. Yeah. And how do you think Starbucks, I mean, they have so many stores, so many employees. What do you think they do best to transmit that vision to every single one of these employees? Come on, Jeremy, it's only 200,000. <laughs> 200,000, exactly. It's not as big as your dynasty. <laughs> um, you know, I think the way they do it is they start at the smallest level. They do it at the store level. And so it is a store manager to an assistant manager, an assistant manager to a frontline shift lead, shift lead to the new employee. I think they have a very, you know, as big as the organization is, they, they function it at the store level. I think that's pretty important. And I also think they preach gospel, which is my big message, and that is all business is personal. There's nothing that we do in business that isn't personal. You know, you know I wrote about Zappos, and you think there's an impersonal reality. Everybody buys shoes online, occasionally calls somebody at a call center with a complaint or problem. But the fact of the matter is that that 
online experiences as personal as they can make it with video and yeah. anything they could do to humanize the shoes and all the other products that they now present. Yeah. Look what you do. I mean, you make a personal connection by using Skype. Uh, you talk to people about real personal stuff. Like nobody's ever asked me before about the contribution my wife made to what I write. I think that's what I'm talking about in business. We need to figure that out. And Starbucks has done a great job of communicating the importance of that. Yeah, for sure. Um, on a lighter note, there was um, I was looking at one of the stories about the founder of a humor site um, mm -hmm. and what he ended up returning. Can you oh, tell people? <laughs> what, what you, that's not humorous. That's sick and repulsive. Make I mean, no, it. he owned a humor site. He was a founder of a humor right. site. Please, if you are drinking something, put it down. I'm about to tell you a story that's going to gross you out. It's the kind of story your adolescent kid would like. So there's this humor site guy who who's testing Starbucks. He, he tests all kinds of brands out. He does all these pranks on brands. And he actually writes books about his pranks. So he goes to Starbucks and they have a, we'll make your drink 100% guaranteed thing, right? So if, you're, if you don't like it, we'll fix it for you. That's the guarantee, simple, no questions asked. So he gets a, he gets a milk-based coffee drink and he brings it home and he puts it in his garage for an eternity in high temperatures until he's got his own little chemistry lab growing inside of the cup and so this thing is putrid it is re repulsive to the core and he can't even bring it in because it's decomposed in the cardboard so he's had to put it into like a Tupperware container he sealed the lid because the smell would kill him on the way into the Starbucks he gets there he hands this Tupperware enclosed formerly paper like object called a Starbucks drink and he says this is not good I cannot drink this <laughs> and now is the test of the brand right does this brand really do what it promises or does the barista look at him and go you idiot you expect to be able to turn this piece of diamond you know and it turns out that the barista yeah, once they were able to get past the whiff of it and get it out to the trash can immediately did what they were supposed to do and they made him a fresh drink without any questions asked so what was intended to kind of prank him turned out to be a demonstration of their brand promise he ends up writing about that instead of how pet badly they behaved and lo and behold you have incredible publicity because of what you're living your brand you're connecting with people and you're doing the right thing yeah and you do real intense research with all these companies was there anything that surprised you with the research um, of this book in particular you know, I, in 2004, I went to the leadership at Starbucks and I said, hey, guys, why don't you ever give away a free drink now and again? I mean, like if people died 12, why don't you throw in the 13th like a baker's dozen, you know? And they looked at me back in those days like I had a third eye in my head. Like, why would we give away a drink that, that dilutes the value of the first 12? So now when I go in and I said, I'm kind of poking at him. I'm saying, gosh, you guys are really into your loyalty program and, you know, your app. And when people buy 12 drinks, they get the 13th free and they can watch all this stuff happen and gamification on their app and how cool is that and would you ever think about maybe going back to a day when you don't give away the 13th drink and what what really impresses me and what surprises me sometimes is we think of leaders as staid and predictable and creatures of habit but great leaders are adaptive and fluid and optimistic and they see potential and so they'll tell you we made a mistake back then we were pompous we were arrogant to believe that customers would always come and that we never needed to reward them for loyalty we get it now Thank you, 2008. So I think that's what surprises me, just how smart they are to learn from shortcomings and changes in economic trends. I mean, the other thing is you get in front of these big brands. How does that work? Who do you approach to, to uh, <laughs> like, I'm going to do a book about I'm you. I'm a great beggar, man. You should see me. I, I, I can grovel <laughs> with the best of them. Um, you know, it's changed. In the early days, I did have to sell. I had to say, look, Trust me, I'll tell your story. I'm, I'm not a bad guy. I'm not going to say evil things about you. This is not going to be a turnaround tell-all story. I'm here to find out what you do great, to share your wisdom, mm -hmm. and to allow people to understand some of the things behind the scenes that you can't tell them credibly, but I could look at and share. So in the early days, it was tough. I mean, like the Ritz-Carlton probably took me a year of begging. I must have gone to their corporate headquarters 10 times, spoke before their corporate leaders, showed them my work products. Um, and it just took forever. So lately, my next book, by the way, is about Mercedes-Benz, which is ah, no I was going to ask brand. about that, but I didn't know if you'd uh, be able to share about it. Yeah, yeah uh, that, that's one of those secrets I'll, I'll let you have. Okay. But um, 
it's not a slouch brand, and, and they should go through the same level of due diligence that a, a, a high-equity brand like Ritz-Carlton does. But the beauty was I got a call one day. Uh, it was, Nora was ill, actually, and I had to make a tough decision about whether I was going to follow through on this commitment, but it, it worked out. Um, and I got a call from the CEO of, of Mercedes-Benz saying, hey, and I want to do a panel discussion. You're the guy who writes about customer experience. We'd like to have somebody representative from Ritz-Carlton. We'd like to have Zappos on a panel. I'd like to be on the panel. Would you facilitate it? So, of course, I'd facilitate it. You know, it doesn't take asking me twice for that. And, you know, as I went up there, I had a book contract in my back pocket, a boilerplate book contract that said, you know, if this worked out well, I was going to walk up to him and say, look, I, you know, I really think you have a story to tell, or you don't. If you didn't, I wouldn't present it. But if you did, uh, why don't we think about doing this? And so, you know, we'll do a couple of years of working with them to help make sure that things go the way they're supposed to go in terms of the revolution of customer experience for Mercedes dealers. But assuming we can deliver the driven to delight program and it's successful, then there's a book already under contract for 2015. Mm -hmm. So I guess the point is there's a tipping point in your career where you may go from begging to being able to make some choices. And now I've turned down many a company that comes to me and says, hey, would you write this book about our pizza company or yeah. whatever it might be? Because I just don't believe that they are living what I write about. Yeah. And that brings up, I want to know what drives you to just keep, keep doing this because obviously you can sit back, you you know, you can take speak engagements. There's a lot of work. But I want to know, how did you get that first, like you said, in your career, you can show past work, but how do you get that first one? Was it When Fish Fly? Was that the first first one? Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to get the first one, isn't it? I, I wrote a parenting book a long, long time ago um, called Humor, Play, and Laughter. So I was writing in the psych, clinical psychologist space. But but um, the work with Johnny Yokoyama, and I'd known Johnny for a while. Um, we'd worked on some things together. He had a book that was successful written about him called Fish. Um, but the book did not tell the true story of how they became successful. So Johnny and I told that story. I told it from his voice. Uh, Johnny was just a wonderful man. He reminded me a lot of my father, fairly simple in his values, but a brilliant mind. And he trusted me. And uh, I was just with Johnny a couple of weeks ago in Seattle, and we were having dinner. And I consider him a surrogate father of mine. Uh, just a very kind man who tr who gave me trust, and I think that almost always happens in your career. You know, nobody is self-made. Not that I found. You're on the backs of giants, yeah. and Johnny Okiyama is one of those giants who let me crawl on his shoulders for a while, and he held me. Yeah. So, what drives you to keep going? To keep producing these heavy research, a lot of work uh, books about brands. Well, I'm glad you appreciate how much work it is because it really is. And there are times I think, I don't know why I do this. It's like too much. Uh, and the interviews and all of it, it, it can be time consuming. So if you think about, well, you know, the, the negative side of it, you probably wouldn't do it. It'd be like having a baby. You know, once you go through delivery, you probably wouldn't do it immediately again. Right. But in the end of the all, it's really what you get is the throughput. I got a letter from a guy in China not long ago who read this book and has read all my books. And he talks about how much they matter to him. And he talks about making adjustments in his lifestyle to yeah. buy the books. I mean, seriously, this oh, guy right. is compromising something in his lifestyle to save enough money to buy the book. I mean, oh my gosh, I am unworthy, you know, seriously. But what I think you start to appreciate is that you have a chance to help people serve better. That's what my job is. Mm -hmm. And help bosses take care of their people better. And if if at the end of the day I could do some small measure to that and the world was a better service oriented place, we cared more about each other, we thought about not just what was in it for us and how hard it was to write the book or to market it, mm -hmm. how much good might come of it. That's the world I want to live in and I want to hand over to my kids. So um, yeah, I don't know. It's probably yeah. high in the sky grandiose fantasy for some, but for me it's real. I'd like to think yeah. that each book gets me a little closer to making some kind of small contribution. Yeah, it does for sure. Um, and I, on that note, I want to find out, um, you know, people are watching this, you know, whether they have a business, they're trying to overcome a challenge in their life. What's a, the best piece of advice you'd have to start leading more of the, the Starbucks way, I guess, so to speak? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, don't listen to a lot of advice. You know, I, I trust that everything is about human relationships and that if we invest authentically and genuinely in other people and we try to make their lives better, we just come from that authentic, true place, things are going to work out. 
Um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't vet all the advice and consider it and put it through your rational mind. But at the end of the day, it gets down to being a good person and yeah. caring about other people and thinking about their needs before your own. And if you develop that otherness in business, a lot of the techniques and tactics that we get drilled into us and business school teaches us, yeah, they don't really play out as much as whether or not we cared well for others. Yeah. Yeah. Just do what's right and what feels yeah, good for the other person. Yeah. What about a mentor? How, tell me a mentor that's influenced you or some oh, good Horst advice you've got. Horst Schultz, he's the, he's the founder of the modern day Ritz Carlton Hotel Company. I went to Horst. He's, he's just, he's 90 something now. And I went to Horst many years ago and I said, Horst, will you be my mentor? And he said, of course, Joseph. And I'm thinking, wow, this is too easy. And then I thought, wait until he tells me how much, cause I'm not gonna be able to afford it. And he's, I said, well, how much Horst? And he says, free. And I'm like, wow, that's my price. This is perfect. This is my day. And he said, but of course, before I can mentor you, I need to know who you're mentoring. And I said, well, Horst, I'm not mentoring anybody. He goes, that's fine. As soon as you're mentoring four people, you call me and then I'll mentor you. I'm like, wow. Well, of course, nobody wants to be my protege, so I have to beg people. But that's okay. I get four people who are my... I find that know, hard to believe. Well, there's a little exaggeration. But, you know, I, I, I went out there and I worked to get four people. And then next thing I know, I call him up and I go, Horse, I got four people. I'm ready to get mentored. And he goes, well, who are they mentoring? I'm like, what is this, an Amway scheme, Horse? <laughs> I mean, when does this actually end in the pyramid? Ultimately, Horse became my mentor and quarterly he... Um, he he works with me, and the beauty is he's just written a book, um, and he's asking me to kind of help him clean it up so we can get it published someday. He's the guy who wrote "Ladies and Gentlemen Serving Ladies and Gentlemen" as the motto of the Ritz Carlton. He was 13. He wrote it observing the qual a service professional in a hotel, and basically what he was saying is if you serve well, it elevates your social status. Being a service professional is not being a servant. Service is not servitude. And he's been a great mentor of mine, and I am forever changed thanks to Horst Schultz. So, what do you look for in a, a mentee? In a mentee? Yeah. Uh, anybody willing to listen? No, actually, I think you need to be hungry, yeah. you need to be honorable, and you need to be honable. So, you know, you need to be eager and inquisitive. You need to have integrity. You need to do what you say and say what you do. And then finally, I think you need to be willing to grow and change. So, if people are like that, um, I love to work with them because uh, they make me better. Okay. Yeah, I like that. What's uh, some of the worst piece of advice you've gotten? And you know, because it, it doesn't have to be from an enemy. You know, we have people who love us who often give us advice and may be not the best practice. What's some advice you've gotten that's not been good? Oh boy, I, I think the biggest advice I, I got was make sure you do everything in social media, right? So, so immediately I, you know, everything that comes up, I'm trying to chase down. It was from somebody I really respected, and they were very smart and they're very successful in my business. But what I started to realize is like. I don't get Facebook and I don't really like Facebook personally. That's just me. So it's not who I am, but I'm good at LinkedIn. So I need to focus my energy on LinkedIn because it's authentically who I am. And every minute I spend in Facebook, I'm not doing something that's good for me in LinkedIn. And then the next thing I know, Pinterest comes up and I feel like I got to do Pinterest, but I don't understand Pinterest. And the next thing you know, I, and so I think the advice was too much about looking for the, all the new shiny tools and not trying to figure out who I am and where I'm effective. Mm -hmm. So it was well intentioned and it's not bad advice to be, you know, saturated in social. You just need to know what you're doing and make sure you have enough bandwidth for it really. Yeah. Yeah. I like that because uh, we do, I do get caught up in the, the latest and greatest. Um, so I have one last question for you, Justin. I appreciate your time. Um, before I do, I want to hear about, you know, what's most exciting right now leading the Starbucks way. What, what should people look out for? Wow. I mean, I think my life is exciting in the broadest sense. You know, I'm, I, as a result of a loss of a family member, you start to appreciate that you don't always have every single day. And it's trying to figure out where to invest my emotional energy now. So mm -hmm. I think I don't have all the answers. You know, I'm trying to explore all my relationships. But work is not the end all anymore. I can tell you that much. I think uh, it's soberingly clear to me that I made it whatever my measure of success was. I made it. I'm blessed beyond my and beyond anything I deserve. And so uh, I love this leading the Starbucks way. I'm enjoying the success of this book like all others. I'm enjoying speaking and consulting. I, I'm honored that clients let me do what I do. But I think the bigger picture is trying to find out what's significant in life, not just what is success. And so I'm trying to focus on that now in a more quiet way uh, and let my heart lead the way a little more. Yeah. So where can people find the book? Um, what's the best site for them to check it out? 
I always say any good bookstore is a bookstore that carries my book. So, you know, at any good bookstore, uh, normally Barnes & Noble is really accommodating. Online, barnesandnoble.com is accommodating. 800-CEO-READ is a great place to buy books if you don't know about it. And then there's uh, obviously, uh, in addition to Barnes & Noble, the Amazon site. Yeah, and I think, um, can they buy it off of leadingthestarbucksway.com? Well, I'll be the- doggone, that's our website, and yes, yeah. you can, Jeremy. Okay. Uh, we would let them do that. It'll just link them back to any one of those okay. other options. And we'll link that up, too, for sure, Leading the Starbucks Way. Right. You know, the last question I had was, um, you know, you were a clinical psychologist for many years. Mm-hmm. What's a good clinical... I think my life's still good, too, by the way. I think I still could practice. Oh, really? But you would- okay. You wouldn't want me to on you, Jeremy. No, I'm a little rusty. A little rusty. My wife's a clinical psychologist, so she'll, she practices on me She'll daily. take care of you. Yes. Yeah, that's why you married that way. That's a good call. What's a good story from, from those days that we haven't talked oh, about? Oh, my goodness gracious. You know, I – um, wow, this is kind of uh, difficult. I worked in child abuse for a long time in my life. I worked in the National Child Abuse Hotline, and um, I worked with a lot of sex offenders. And oh. And I just remember very vividly um, a young kid who I think overcame much of the damage of the abuse that they sustained in their lives. And I remember watching their journey to reclaiming uh, their integrity, their worth, to shedding the shame, uh, and to coming from a place where they were acting out a lot to seeing that there was more to life if mm-hmm. they followed a more traditional success path. So I think when you think about being deep in lives of people, as psychologists do, when you get that opportunity to be that intimate and watch somebody transform, it is a blessing of untold proportions. Yeah. Joseph, thank you so much. Thank you for being so open. This is just absolutely amazing. And um, everyone should go, go check out Leading the Starbucks Way and uh, the other great books that, that Joseph has out there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. It was an honor. You are an amazing person. Blessings oh. to you and your family. Oh, thank you very much.